Sony Pictures Classics presents The Miracle Club, a new film starring Maggie Smith, Kathy Bates, and Laura Linney, about four women who travel to the sacred French town of Lourdes in search of a miracle. Though the trip is the chance of a lifetime, old wounds are reopened along the way, forcing the women to confront their pasts. The Miracle Club opens everywhere Friday, July 14th, only in theaters. Welcome to Inside the Vatican with America Media. Each week, veteran Vatican reporter Gerardo Connell and I will take you behind the headlines on the biggest stories out of the Vatican. So many bishops or theologians have the meaning that we can change a little bit our outlook and modernize the presentation and then the people will come back. Cardinal Gerhard Muller, an open critic of many of Pope Francis' initiatives, has released a new book in which he blasts the Synod on Synodality, Papal Resignations and Pope Francis' relationship with U.S. President Joe Biden. Ser homosexual no es un delito. No es un delito. Sí, pero es pecado. Bueno, primero, distinguamos pecado por delito. Pero también es pecado... The day after we recorded this episode, Pope Francis gave a wide-ranging interview to the Associated Press, in which he addressed a range of topics, including homosexuality, his own handling of the sexual abuse crisis, the Vatican-China agreement, and his own health. But perhaps most relevant to this episode, Pope Francis responded to his critics on many fronts. You can read my summary of the interview at americamagazine.org and listen to our ITB minisode recapping key points of the interview. At the end of the Angelus, Pope Francis announced that both synodality and Christian unity are two goals that the Church seeks and that are interconnected. Synods depend upon having both the confidence to speak and the humility to listen. Listening is daring to open yourself to people who've got views other than your own. Pope Francis has instructed all bishops traveling to the Vatican for the first main session of the Synod on Synodality this October to arrive in Rome early for an ecumenical prayer vigil and a silent retreat. The retreat will be led by Timothy Radcliffe, the former leader of the Dominican Order. The visit is going to take place very soon. In 10 days' time, the Holy Father will be landing here in Juba together with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the moderator. Pope Francis will visit the Democratic Republic of the Congo and South Sudan from January 31st to February 5th, in a long-awaited visit that was postponed last year because of his recurring knee troubles. I'm Ricardo de Silva, and this is Inside the Vatican. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Ricardo, from a sunny beautiful day in Rome. I must confess, I'm not sure what the weather's like in New York today. I rushed here, the trains were late. So it's an ordinary day in New York City. Jerry, it appears to be this sort of tell-all season of books uh, at the Vatican at the moment. Two weeks ago, we had Archbishop Georg Ganswein's book with all those revelations about what was going on between Pope Francis and Pope Benedict. Last week, we We had Cardinal George Pell's posthumously revealed writings and the the memo and the letter. This week, you've read a new book by Cardinal Gerhard Muller, which again seems to contain attacks on Pope Francis. Yes, it's an amazing period in the the pontificate. And I I suspect, Ricardo, that the next two years may well be a roller coaster kind of season here in Rome. First, the Ganschwein book, then the Pell posthumous articles and stories, and now Cardinal Muller's 224-page interview book with an Italian journalist, Franca Gian Soldati, who writes for the Messaggero paper. It's a national paper, but really it's the Rome paper, which Pope Francis glances at in the morning. So he was appointed as the prefect or head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith, the Vatican's doctrinal body, by Benedict XVI. He was not made a cardinal until Pope Francis took over the papacy. And then Francis didn't renew him as the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Jerry, what else do we need to know about Cardinal Muller? Well, he he, he was a bishop in Germany. He was a friend of Cardinal Ratzinger of Benedict XVI. Benedict XVI brought him to Rome, appointed him in 2012 as the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Francis, in 2017, after he had done his first five-year stint as prefect, said, I am not 
going to renew you for another five years. And it seems, uh, according to Muller, he offered him another job, but he never explained the reason why. So he was prefect only for the first five years of Francis' papacy? He was prefect for five years. And that, that is the normal term of office for prefect. Francis took him over from Benedict and continued counting, as it were, from the date of his original appointment. But it seems that in some ways their relationship, much like Genschwein was soured by the fact that he was not renewed as prefect of the papal household, for Cardinal Muller, uh, it was not being renewed as prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine and the Faith. Yes, Muller was obviously very unhappy, and he, he doesn't hide his unhappiness in the book. And he says at least twice in the book, if not more, the Pope Francis never explained the reasons. But now, having read 224 pages, I understand very well why the Pope Francis did not feel that Cardinal Muller was on the same page as him. So let's get into the reasons that you get from this book, perhaps for why Pope Francis didn't renew Cardinal Muller. Well, I'll give you some of the reasons. If you read the first chapter, you will find that Cardinal Muller is not only unhappy with the German synodal way, he's actually unhappy with Pope Francis's synodal path, the synodal process, the synod on synodality that is now underway. And he says, this is really moving to a democratization of the church. It's moving to a Protestantization of the church, making the church more Protestant. And, of course, that's not what Francis is doing. Jerry, what does he mean by Protestantization? I mean, obviously that it's making the church more Protestant, but in which respects? Well, he really is, believes that uh, it's being handed over more to the lay people, that everybody's having their say in it, the bishop's uh, role, authority somehow being diminished. He doesn't unpack it so much, but he uses the, he uses like almost interchangeably democratization of the church and Protestantization of the church as distinct from a hierarchical church. That's really, I, I think, his bottom line. And so if he's conveyed that view to Francis, which I'm sure he must have, obviously Francis would have said, well, we're really not on the same page. Then he disagrees with the Pope's position towards China. He describes President Xi Jinping as a modern-day god, like the Roman emperors were considered as gods. He now is a god, and he said, you shouldn't be dialoguing with the devil. Of course, this is a phrase from Francis, but he he's using it in relation to the Pope's relation to China. So saying that the Pope is dialoguing with the devil, Basically. characterizing China as the devil. Of course, he praises Cardinal Zen as a modern-day martyr, like Cardinal Minzenzi in Hungary, Cardinal Beran in Czechoslovakia, other cardinals who, Stepinak, and such like, the great heroes of the church in Eastern Europe under communism. And he strongly disagrees with the Vatican agreement with China on the appointment of bishops, correct? Yes, he said, you don't dialogue with the devil. And he said, we shouldn't be really going down. We should be standing by the church that is faithful. And he said, the church in China, and he's referring to the church recognized by the state, they shouldn't be acolytes or altar boys of the state, echoing what Francis said about Kirill in Ukraine. So he's using Francis's words to make criticisms of moves by Francis. Ex exactly. He, and he doesn't quote them, but you can see the parallels. Mm -hmm. uh, then he talks about many other things. So bringing Cardinal Muller's criticisms a little closer to home, he also has things to say about the U.S. church and particularly the relationship that Pope Francis has with President Joe Biden. Yes, he compares Francis' relation towards Trump, President Trump, with how he treats uh, President Biden. He said he criticized Trump for putting up a wall between Mexico and the United States. And he said, of course, we agree with him on this. But then he seems to give President Biden a pass on the question of communion, even though uh, he is supporting uh, abortion. And so he said the, the Pope should be above the political differences. He's suggesting that Francis really 
has kind of weakened on this point. And he criticizes brother cardinals, right? I mean, he's criticized Cardinal McElroy in this book as well. He criticizes Cardinal McElroy for, he said, he's presenting the Eucharist as a private thing. Of course, this is not what Cardinal McElroy is doing. But it's it's a long list of things that he feels. So it's less a coherent book. It's responding to various topics of the day. But what comes out of it really is that He's giving the answer to his own question. Why did Francis not renew me for another five years? Because then I would be 75 and I would have done 10 years as prefect. He's showing very clearly that his way of thinking was not that of Francis on the question of church, and especially on this key issue of synodality. He sees the German church as really more or less departing from Rome. He's very critical of the German synod. He feels Rome should be more articulate and come in strongly on this question. He feels Rome should be much more outspoken in the defense of human rights, of the Uyghurs in China, of the people in Hong Kong, of other situations. He even says Francis should be more outspoken on Ukraine. Well, this is extraordinary because Francis has spoken more than almost 150 times now on the Ukraine. And so it's a book that will raise many points of discussion. This book is the third in less than a month. We have Genschwein's tell-all book. We then had Pell's memo and the letter. Now we have this book by Cardinal Muller. They all draw out similar themes and almost identical criticisms of the papacy of Pope Francis. Why do you think this is so prevalent now? You know, Ricardo, I, I've studied and followed the papacies, modern papacies. And I've followed the end of the last seven years of John Paul II. I remember books coming out about the next pope. And they were really raising issues of, about what was had gone wrong in John Paul II's papacy. I saw also Benedict was coming in for a lot of criticism and there was questions being raised. And I remember even Time magazine had a front page story in 2010 saying, you know, Benedict's nightmare and how he had dealt with the question of abuse in Germany. So it's kind of par for the course that near what people see as near the end of a pontificate, uh, people are looking beyond the pontificate. They're identifying the problem areas of the current pope, but they're looking to a future dream pope that they would like to have. Obviously, there's a whole group who are not happy with Francis's papacy. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Ganschwein, in his book, he says what has happened is not that Benedict and Francis have been clashing, but their group of fans of both popes have been clashing publicly. But, I mean, Jerry, you, you mentioned the criticisms. We hear those loud and clear, right? And there are certainly those who defend Pope Francis, but their voices seem to be almost swallowed up uh, in the noise that we're getting from the critics. I mean, who are Pope Francis' vocally defensive fans? Look, I think, uh, Ricardo, we've got to distinguish what happens in the Anglophone world, and especially in North America, and what happens, say, in Africa or in Asia. This same kind of echo is not being heard in these continents much. The attacks are coming more in the Anglophone world. I'm not saying only, I'm saying more in the Anglophone world, but also because there you have the megaphones reflecting the voices of the of what I still confidently say is, is a minority. I talked recently to the president of the Asian bishops. They said Pope Francis there is really so supported and admired. I think it's just the critical voices or voices that get a lot of attention because they are lifted in the media and it's part of what what the media does, what we do, we are to blame too, to lift points of criticism, to raise suspicion uh, when suspicion is raised in the slightest, and we don't lift the voices which seem to cheer the great initiatives of Pope Francis. Yes, but the, the, there are two facts as well. That the What I've said before in this program, that we're dealing with the conflictual nature of the Western media, that if you don't have conflict, you don't have good news, in, in a sense. And the good news 
is not told. The, the bad news tends to predominate. You, you, you analyze any television news program at night. What are the main stories? Are they the good news stories of what many good people are doing? Or are they the problems, the, the killings, the, the negativity? It seems that Pope Francis' fault finders, his critics, aren't going to be won over by him anytime soon. We've seen that this week with the release of some plans. At